So hi, and welcome to Zero to Test, how to run your first beta testing program. So just a quick introduction to myself. Uh, my name is Crystal Yan, and my background is actually in economics. Uh, I found myself in the field of user experience because I realized I really love asking a lot of questions, asking why a lot, and uh, realized that was a really great trait for someone in the field of UX. So I've been called a UX researcher, a UX designer, product manager. Uh, one thing I have never been called is a Selenium expert, so keep that in mind during the question uh, time. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, uh, at CrystalCY. Um, if we don't have a chance to get to your question during this session, feel free to tweet it at me. Happy to answer all your questions about uh, UX testing or user testing. So um, just a quick uh, definition. I find this is helpful because I don't want to go through the whole talk and then have someone ask a question at the end saying, like, what were you referring to when you said beta testing? Um, when I uh, speak about beta testing today, what I'll be talking about is um, putting a working version of your prototype in a user's hands, watching them use it over time, uh, whether you're doing that from afar looking at analytics or you're doing it up close uh, sitting right in front of them. Um, I just want to quickly go over how this differs from other kinds of user testing um, in general. So um, in general, at least at our organization, we do primarily three different types of user testing. Uh, the first is what we call prototype testing. And this is when someone from our design team puts together a mock-up of something that looks very much real, and they put it in front of our users, and they can click through it, it's interactive, they can go through the same workflow that they might if it was a real version of software, um, and it helps us uncover things like usability with the particular design. And uh, that's what we refer to as prototype testing. Um, sort of down the line is another type of testing that we do, um, typically usability testing. Uh, it's what most organizations call it. So it's when um, a user is using a version of our software that is already live and used by all of our clients. And we bring them in and we ask them to perform certain tasks. And when they uh, perform those tasks, we're able to uncover, you know, maybe there's something they actually can do, uh, but they think it's broken because they can't seem to find out how to do it. Um, and somewhere in the middle is uh, a type of testing that we call beta testing. And what this means is that before we're officially launching a new feature or we're officially launching a new app, we put the prototype in the hands of our users. They can use it for a defined period of time. And it's sort of like a rough draft, um, but it is actually built by someone on our development team. And in this period of time, we're looking to uncover a couple different things. Sometimes we're looking for usability issues. Other times we're looking to look for bugs and things that we need to actually uh, write testing plans for. And other times we're actually looking for things that a product person is really concerned about, which is what are the functionality gaps that it takes to get to a minimum viable product? So all of these things are things that we could be looking for in a beta testing program. Um, today I'll talk about a couple different examples where in some cases we were looking for one, in other cases we were looking for something else. Uh, and in general, I would say that it's really valuable to us to run a beta testing program because, uh, you know, as a user experience professional, I'm constantly developing product sense and developing better instincts to get a better sense of what our users want. But at the end of the day, I am not our user, and I can't predict everything about what they might do when they have our software in their hands. So beta testing helps us kind of uh, mitigate that risk by making sure that they have a chance to use it, and we have a chance to observe what exactly they're using it for, and how we might be able to learn from what we need to test better. So just to quickly go over what I'm going to talk about today. So I want to talk about uh, two different examples of different beta testing programs that I've at least worked on before. Now, you might notice that they might be slightly different from what uh, you might traditionally think of as a, a beta testing program, and the reason for that is both examples are for organizations that were either um, in a B2C con um, B2B context, so they were we are building a product for other organizations, so we typically have a smaller user base and a very niche kind of user. Um, and another one was a consumer product, but it was before any product existed in the market, so we actually need to figure out um, uh, how to recruit some of those users. So they might be a little bit different in terms of the actual operations of the beta testing program from what you might think of, um, but I think it's a good chance for us to learn a little bit more about how to run a beta testing program in a slightly different environment. And uh, then I'll go through three different steps that you can go through to start running your own beta testing program when you go back. Um, the first is, how do you sell the idea of testing to your manager or your client in the first place? 
Uh, how do you integrate testing into the development lifecycle, and how do you partner with other stakeholders? And then finally, once you're running the test, how do you draw valuable insights from that? And how do you share those insights back out with the rest of your team? OK, so uh, the two examples we'll talk about here today are um, the fiscal note for iOS app, which launched about two years ago in the fall of 2015. It's an app that I still work on today uh, with the team as we continue to develop new features for it. But I'll specifically talk about the few months where we were uh, working on the product before it even launched. And then uh, the second example I'll talk about is uh, an app called Real Talk. And I worked uh, with their team as a consultant, as a freelance UX designer. And that was earlier this year, and they actually just launched um, a few weeks ago. So uh, I want to spend a little bit of time giving you some organizational context, because my understanding is uh, there's probably a lot of different uh, organizations represented in our audience today. Um, some of you might be coming from consumer companies. Some of you might be coming from enterprise companies. Some of you might be working in-house, and some of you might be working um, as consultants. And so I want to speak uh, to a little bit about so the organizational context, the size of our team, the UX team, and then the size of the quality team that we are working with, because I think that's helpful um, context for some of the decisions that we chose to make. So um, uh, I'm with a company called Fiscono. We're a B2B enterprise software as a service company based in Washington, DC, with offices in New York as well. And our users are public policy and government relations professionals. So these are people, their job, whenever something changes in the government, they have to be the first to know about it. They have to be able to tell their organization how it might impact their bottom line. And they have to think about how they want to respond to it. So um, specifically, a lot of our users at this time, uh, this point in time in the fall of 2015, were people who focus on state policy. So they were responsible for figuring out when a law might change or when legislation was proposed in any one of 50 states. Uh, between the months of January to June, they were uh, traveling in maybe four to five state capitals each week. So imagine going from Sacramento uh, to Harrisburg um, to uh, Austin in the span of just a couple days. And so for them, it was really critical to have this information in their hand at all times, um, especially because they weren't going to bring their laptop with them for some of these work trips. So uh, in August of 2015, our CEO came to me, and he came to uh, one other engineer at a company who had been an iOS developer for quite some time, and he said, is there a way you can launch a mobile app for us in four months? And keep in mind, at this time, we had also just launched our API. And so we said, we, we can try. Uh, and we were able to deliver that on that timeline. Uh, in the middle of that four-month period, we did hire another iOS engineer. And um, our quality team at the time was um, one QA engineer and one QA intern. And the product team, uh, or the UX team, was just myself. So uh, we all had to wear a lot of different hats. But um, when we ran our beta testing program, our goal was to figure out how can we uncover the th ways that people might use this app? And how can we uncover that as early as possible so we might be able to think about the things that we need to test for um, and mitigate some of that risk? And uh, we chose to specifically focus on usability and bugs. And when I say bugs, um, uh, this is actually a problem that's pretty specific to our business. But uh, in our case, um, bugs are typically one of two things. The first is data quality. And when I say data, I mean government data. So we have scrapers that we've built out that um, scrape information from different government websites. They're updated in as real time as we can get. Um, but sometimes the government will change their website, which means that it's hard for the information to stay updated. So sometimes when a user reports a data issue, it's actually a case where um, we might not have gotten the government data updated in time. Uh, another kind of bug is a more standard kind of bug where something in the product simply doesn't work. And so we wanted to uncover both of those different types of issues um, during our beta testing program and be able to help prioritize which um, tests we wanted to run. And then, uh, and then we also wanted to look at usability to make sure that things were able to be found. And what we learned a lot from this pr uh, beta testing program was primarily around usability and uncovering bugs. We were able to make some certain changes to the design in order for it to be more usable and things to be a little bit more intuitive. And we were also able to prioritize uh, which data issues and which um, you know, something in the software is not working issues we wanted to fix. 
Uh, the second example I want to talk about is a beta testing program that I ran for an organization called Real Talk. And so um, the founders of this organization uh, formerly were educators and now they're public health professionals. And so they were teaching in a school in North Carolina when they realized a good portion of their students um, would become pregnant before graduating and this would significantly affect their chances to go to college um, and the choices they would be able to make for their career. And uh, at least um, in that school and in many schools in the United States, the way that teens learn about a lot of these topics is in the classroom. And the reality is uh, most teenagers these days are digital natives. If they don't feel comfortable asking a certain question in class, they're certainly going to look for information online. And if they look for information online, a lot of that information might not be true. And if the information isn't true, then it could affect their behavior, and that can lead to very severe consequences, especially for teenagers from a low-income background in the rural South. And so what the founders wanted to do was they thought, what if there's a way that we could connect students where they were already going anyway? What if there's a way we could use technology and storytelling in order to transform sex education? And their app was about sh letting teens share their stories with each other and then linking them to trusted content with uh, you know, true information. Um, and so um, in our usability test, uh, testing, we did one hour sessions where we try to figure out, um, can a user figure out how to get to the next step in this workflow? And what we realized was that wasn't quite enough. The mission of the organization was to change behavior. And in order to make sure that teens were going to find this valuable, we need to make sure that they not only downloaded it and looked through it and found it interesting one time, that they would use it um, over time. And so we decided to run um, a beta testing period where we gave a prototype to our users and they could use it over a period of time. And what we learned in this test was that it really mattered that uh, in order for users to continue to use this, that they had new content and they had it every single day. And they hel this helped the organization prioritize um, their content acquisition strategy, and that actually was a bigger focus compared to uh, the other things that we learned about usability and the different bugs that we uncovered um, during the beta testing program. So, as you can see, sometimes the priorities differ. Uh, so now that I've go gone through a couple of examples, I want to briefly talk about three different steps that you can take to start running your first beta testing program tomorrow. So first, and most importantly probably, is to sell the idea of testing to your manager or to your client. So uh, I like to use this framework. Um, these are the three main uh, arguments that I try to make. Peer pressure, metrics, and talent development. And that last one is sometimes a little surprising to people, but what this might look like is, um, say, uh, company X did this, and it led to these results. And not only did this deliver real insights to the business, it actually also helped our team develop. And what that might look like specifically is if you're talking to a manager or a client, you can share an article about a company that they admire or a competitor in the space who is doing something similar. Uh, when it comes to metrics, you can say, hey, look at this last release that we did. Our user engagement metrics were slightly lower than expected. What if we could uncover this earlier on in the beta testing period and think of ways that we might be able to move that metric up and so that by the time we launch, we're able to actually hit that KPI. And then finally, uh, for talent development, uh, what you can say is, if we start integrating beta testing into a part of our testing plan, in the grand scheme of how we think about testing, we can write about the process that we used in order to do this, and other organizations will come look at us. I mean, talented people are motivated not only by the technical craft of their work, but also about knowing that their work had a real impact on real people. And so if we can write about how we have a user-centered approach um, to testing and we think about it very holistically, maybe that'll encourage more people to work with us, if you're working with a client, you can say, this is an opportunity to train your in-house team on how to be more customer-centric. Uh, so the second piece is around integrating testing and making sure you're partnering with your teams. And this part is actually quite tactical, right? So say you sold your manager on the idea of beta testing, and they're all for it. Uh, now you actually have to deliver on that and make sure that you're going to have real results to show. So how do you go about planning a beta testing program? Well, the first thing you have to do is realize you have a lot of decisions to make. So when I first started, um, I first pitched the idea of doing a beta testing program, I tried to go online to look for resources for something that would walk me through step by step what I had to do. 
And I actually had a quite a hard time uh, finding that, which is kind of why I developed um, this talk in the first place. So uh, the first thing I had to decide was who I wanted to test with. Um, did I want it to be a public beta or did I want it to be a private beta? And I mentioned a little bit earlier that for the examples that I talked through, uh, it was unique in the sense that most people weren't necessarily coming to us. Now, if you're with a much larger organization and you say you want to run a beta test, um, you can say, hey, like we're releasing a beta version of our software, sign up if you're interested. Uh, there's a good chance you will get a good number of people who will come to you, they'll sign up. Um, in my case specifically, I was working with two different startups, so we actually didn't have that luxury. We had to go recruit people for ourselves. And the other reason for that was we were working with very, very specific users. So we needed people whose job was to work in public policy or government relations, and we needed uh, teenagers in the rural south. And um, in order to make sure that we were making the best possible decision for our target audience, we had to go out and find them. In our case, um, for Fiscal Note, we went and uh, looked at our internal uh, user base, and we reached out and partnered with our client success managers, people who were responsible for managing client accounts, and worked with, in partnership with them in order to invite users to our beta testing program. Uh, with Real Talk, we partnered with teachers, uh, mostly because the students are uh, under 18, and so we wanted to make sure we had a strong relationship with the different adult figures in their life um, who would be able to invite them and make sure that all the paperwork was all cleared. Uh, the second thing you have to decide is what you want to test. So you can test either a single feature, you can test multiple features, or you can test the entire application. I would recommend if you are running your first beta test to start working with a single feature. So what you can do is you can choose a feature that's going to be coming out soon and uh, make sure that a certain group of people only have access to that specific feature and just um, see what you can uncover in terms of insights for that particular feature. Um, in our case, uh, for Fiscal Note at least, we were releasing the mobile app of a web app that already existed and people already used. So they were familiar with the features that we were releasing, and that's why we decided to beta test the entire app. So depending on the context of what you want to test, that might make the most sense. Uh, the third thing that you can, uh, you'll have to decide is what you want to focus on. So I said earlier that it really matters um, to articulate what your goals are, right? So your goals could be to look for usability issues, it could be look to uncover bugs, or it could be look to uncover uh, functionality gaps to an MVP. Uh, and the fourth thing you'll have to decide is when and how you want to collect feedback. So in any case, you should be tracking everything and making sure that all of your uh, user events are um, tracked and measured in um, your analytics platform. Uh, in our case, we made sure to not only do that, but also supplement it with qualitative research. So in addition to the quantitative analytics we had, we also set up follow-up calls with people where we actually talk to them and sort of observe them as they were using the platform. And in this case, we were looking for getting feedback um, that they sort of spoke out loud to us, and we did this with one-on-one uh, one -on -one with users. In general, I think that it's a bit better to collect feedback um, with individuals than with groups of people. That way you can avoid groupthink. But I would say that the one scenario in which it might make sense to get feedback from a group of people is if you are working in the context of enterprise software and you need to better understand how a team of users collaborate with your software, then it might be useful to look at a team. But if possible, I would also try to uh, talk to each of those team members one on one. And then finally, uh, you'll have to decide how you want to measure the outcome. So uh, in our case, we set a couple KPIs that we wanted to track throughout the beta testing period. And this really helped us get a better sense of what we were learning throughout the process and how it was impacting different metrics in our operations. And I'll go into that a little bit more. So uh, after you decide how you want to fit UX research and beta testing into your uh, product development process, you'll need to think about how you want to partner with other teams. And so what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to walk through uh, very tactical resources. So this is actually an example of a timeline that I sent out to the rest of our company. You'll see here that I decided um, we were going to test with employees internally, and we were also going to test with uh, users externally. We were looking for testing the features in our MVP, so I had to clarify which features they were. Uh, we were looking to test for usability and also for bugs. 
And uh, in addition to tracking all the different events that our users would trigger when they were using our product, we also wanted to do some follow-up qualitative research by uh, talking to users um, and bringing them into our office and running through usability testing with the beta version of our software. So that sort of covers um, how we wanted to get the feedback. And the two KPIs that we chose to track at this point in time were the number of tickets that were submitted during the beta testing program and also our app store rating after launch. Uh, if I were to do this again, I would have reorganized the email so it was a little easier to read, but um, in the spirit of honesty, this is the original email that I sent out uh, two years ago. And uh, this is an example of an email that I actually sent out to our users in order to invite them to be a part of the beta testing program. And I'm actually just gonna bold a couple key things in here and explain why I chose to use certain words. So one thing I said was that I was a part of the design research team. And the reason I said that instead of introducing myself as the UX designer or the product manager for the product was because I wanted to make it sound like someone else in my company had designed the product. And uh, I found that users in general want to, you know, make you happy, right? They don't want to tell you, oh, like, you've worked on this for four months. I actually really hate it. It's really hard to use. Um, so, uh, but I actually want to hear that if they hate it, right? It helps me better understand um, their, their needs if I can hear the positive and the negative feedback. And I find that introducing myself as a part of the research team, sort of an independent third party, also evaluating the effectiveness of the product, that helps them be a little bit more honest with me. Another thing that I say is I say that their client success manager recommended them uh, for the beta testing program. So our users are very well paid, they're very busy, they are not necessarily, some of them are not necessarily very technology savvy. So like if I said beta testing to them, I, I don't know if they really knew what that meant. Um, what I said instead was, you know, when they asked what that was, I would say, it's a chance for you to give feedback on it or get a preview of the product before it's released. And to encourage them to say yes to this opportunity, I mentioned that the name of their client success manager, who's their main point of contact with our company, and that they thought they'd be a great fit for this. They'd be someone who would give great feedback. And that really did help in terms of increasing our conversion rates for the number of users we reached out to who actually ended up saying yes to us. Uh, we're also fortunate that we are based in Washington, D.C., and a good number of our users are in D.C. So if I knew the user was in D.C., which I could find by looking them up in our um, sort of CRM software, I made sure to mention that and said that I would be happy to meet them at their office. This gave me a chance to not only build rapport with them, but also be able to make sure that I could watch their face and watch the way that they reacted when they were using different parts of the platform. And then finally, the call to action I asked. Um, sometimes I see this a lot in emails that people send me, uh, particularly when someone is trying to sell me some kind of tool that they think would be a great thing for a product manager or UX designer to use. They say something like, hey, like, let me know when you're free, or hey, let me know if you're interested. And uh, at that point, if I, even if I reply and say, yes, I'm interested because I'm busy, maybe I'm reading the email on my phone, um, I might not, like, it'll take a couple more emails to get to a step where we can actually get to the next step of actually talking. So instead I ask for something that is uh, a little bit more time box. So I'll say, when are you free this week? And it makes it really easy for the person that's, the very busy person who's reading my email to check their calendar for just that week and send me maybe two or three times. Um, and at that point, we're maybe one or two emails away from actually getting a chance to talk to each other. Uh, it's also a lot easier for you, especially if you're reaching out to a lot of people, um, to have to make, shorten that scheduling time. Cool. And so assuming that you've gone through all of this and you've started running your beta testing program, it's going really well. Uh, now I think the last thing you need to do is figure out how do I make sure I'm getting the most insights from this and how do I share it with the rest of my team? So what I want to just briefly cover is that in order to make sure that you're uh, documenting your findings, you can, ask to, you can ask your users if it's okay to record um, your session and uh, make that audio recording available to the rest of your colleagues. And when I started working on this project, I was working with two uh, other iOS engineers who had been developing for um, almost 10 years each. 
And uh, for me um, to sort of come in there and say like, my job is to help make sure all the decisions we're making about our product are grounded in customer insights, it really helped build trust um, with the rest of the team who really hadn't had beta testing be a part of the decision making process. They really didn't have to use insights from beta testing as a part of prioritizing what they wanted to test uh, to begin with. So just having that audio available um, really helped build that trust. And the reality is your colleagues are pretty busy. They're probably not going to listen to every single audio recording. So, you know, if you like cough or say, like make a bad joke in there, th they might not even hear it, um, but they might listen to part of one um, of the audio recordings you send over and just be able to hear some of those quotes directly from users. That's the part they care about the most. Uh, another thing I like to do is inviting one of my colleagues to be a part of uh, the session. So I'll bring them in, uh, whether it, if we're doing something over the phone, it's much easier to invite multiple colleagues. Um, and that's also really helpful because they can help take notes. So if you're the one busy asking a lot of questions and making sure you're asking follow-up questions and asking why a lot, you might be a little too busy to actually ask questions um, and making sure that you're clarifying and making sure you heard everything correctly. And your colleague in the room can help take notes and make sure that everything is being documented and you can go and debrief. Uh, I didn't actually put this up here, but I would also say that if you're going with a colleague, it's really helpful to book um, maybe 15 to 20 minutes right after your meeting, just for the two of you to catch up and just talk about what you saw and uh, write down the bullet points of the key findings right then and there, because otherwise for the rest of the day, you might have other work that you're working on or other meetings you have to go to. And to try to remember that a little bit later is much harder than writing it all down when the memory's still fresh in your mind. So um, in terms of sharing that out with your team um, and making sure that people are invited to hear all those insights, what I like to do is um, at the end of each user test, an individual one, after I have that meeting with my colleague, we'll write down maybe two or three bullet points of the key findings from what we learned, and then we'll uh, include a link to the full uh, notes of our session. And this is the notes are probably more transcript style. They include every single detail. Um, but we go through and pick out sort of the key findings because we know that not everyone's going to read um, the detailed notes. Um, and then we also include a link to the audio if applicable. Now, we used to actually do this. Um, uh, in 2015, our company was less than 100 people. We actually used to send this out to the entire company, which people really appreciated. Uh, the company has grown since then, so we can no longer send it out to the entire company, but we actually send it out to the entire product team. And then we also publish it to our internal wiki and then um, make sure that any updates um, or any new content for that internal wiki is posted in our company newsletter. So that's a way to make sure to that, that all of the, what you learned is shared out with the rest of the team. And then in addition to sort of talking about the key insights from each individual user test, which is very easy to remember because it's a very specific story, I like to also supplement that by debriefing patterns. So in a weekly team meeting, um, we might have had a couple user tests since um, the last time that we met. I like to debrief some key patterns that we found. So one example is um, there is a feature that we're going to launch uh, a beta testing uh, program for soon, and it's for a new feature in our existing platform. And one thing that we learned um, over looking at the user sessions for this, uh, it, it for multiple users in a period of a couple weeks, was that we were debating internally for quite some time about whether or not to go with one design, redesign for the navigation or another. Um, at the same time, we were also beta testing a new dashboard. And what we realized was for the user, they, weren't, they didn't even notice the new navigation. They were just navigating with the different modules in the dashboard. So this really helped us prioritize what we wanted to spend our team meetings even discussing. Uh, the thing that we thought would be so important ended up not being very noticeable to the user at all. And that was actually really helpful to make sure that we we're focusing on the information architecture in that case, rather than just the design, which makes sense for a navigation project. Um, and then in addition to, so I've talked about audio and I've talked about text, but um, we also like sharing insights with video. And there's two different ways that we do this. So the first is if we're bringing someone in for a follow-up to a week-long pilot or uh, a couple weeks long uh, beta testing program, we um, might have them in one room and that's the testing room. And then we'll actually screen share what we're doing in the testing room to an observation room. 
and we would invite uh, the larger group of uh, people in the company or the research and development team to view what was happening in the testing room and watch the user interact with the beta version of the product. Uh, another thing that you can do if you can't necessarily do this or you're working on a consumer uh, product with millions of users and you want to make sure to get some of this information at scale, uh, you can implement a tool. Um, we use a tool called Full Story where you can essentially watch a user session over their, sh it feels like you're watching them over their shoulder, um, but it's essentially just kind of recreating the different steps they're taking in your product. And every once in a while in our team, we'll get together in a room and we'll watch a couple user sessions that way. And it's a way for us to sort of um, see uh, the way the user is using the beta version of our product, but not necessarily in the context of a moderated user test. And, um, and then I think probably this is a benefit from working in a smaller company, but we're able to work very, very closely with our quality team in order to make sure that all the different testing plans that they build um, and the user stories that they're referencing in the tickets, they're edited to reflect the things that we learn in user tests. Um, and so uh, this makes sure that any time that we're making a decision based on a user story, it's grounded in real customer insights. Great, so um, in conclusion, uh, I just want to briefly recap the different steps that we talked about today. Uh, the first is when you're selling your manager or your client on the idea of testing, make sure that you're leveraging peer pressure, metrics, or talent development as a couple of the reasons why you should start testing. The second is that uh, in order to make sure that the testing goes well, you want to make sure that you're planning it out, every single detail, who, uh, what, where, when, and how. And once you've made these decisions, uh, make sure that to communicate those out with your team. Um, it really, really uh, matters that people are on the same page about what you're focusing on for the test, what the goals are. And the third is uh, once you are running the test, make sure that you're drawing those insights, but more importantly, sharing them with the rest of your team, bringing them to the table so that everyone um, can be united in creating a great user experience. Thank you.